Еве сме во студиото на Универзитетската телевизија. Денеска моја чест е гостин да го имам доктор Кент Брентли, американски лекар од медицинската мисионерска група Smartian Purse. Додека ги лекувал пациентите, овој доктор во Либерија, тој самиот заболел од вирусот Ебола, инако е првиот американец вратен од во Соединетите американски држави со цел да биде лекуван од ова страшно заболување и го лекувале со тогаш експериментален лек во универзитетската болница Емори во Аталанта во Джорджија. По неколку месечно лекување тој е успешно излекуван, денеска го имаме овде во студиото на универзитетската телевизија, човекот минатата година е прогласен, односно 2014-та за личност на годината од магазинот Тайм, неколку пати имал почесни средби со американци во Соединетите американски држави бил дел од мисијата за за помагање на многу луѓе кои што биле заболени од ова заболување. Се на се мене ми е многу чест што го имам денес овде во студиото. Welcome to the university. Thank you. Welcome to our TV studio. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. We are going to talk about your interesting story, but first of all, uh, how do you feel? How's your health? How do you feel here in Stiff? I'm I'm doing very well. Thank you. I'm very fortunate, very thankful to have made a full recovery from my illness. And I'm, I'm very glad to be here in Steep and to, to see your, your town and your university and, and meet some of the people here. It's a, a very, uh, very much a great honor to be here. So you're going to talk on the students. You're going to have a lecture. What are the key points you will uh, to convey to the medical students and all the interesting people of the, uh, here in Steep? I will be sharing my story my experience in Liberia um, before Ebola as well as my experience with the disease and and I hope to convey among other things the importance of compassion in medicine mm -hmm. that that is really our motivation for becoming physicians and taking care of patients is to, to show compassion to people in need how did it happen that you were infected with uh, Ebola? I mean, uh, what was crucial to contract it, uh, this disease? Uh, I guess the doctors are, are well prepared, are uh, pro protecting uh, while working in, with these patients. How that happened? So I was living and working in Liberia before Ebola came to our town. And when Ebola came to our region, we, we prepared for months and then we engaged in caring for patients with Ebola. And in the Ebola treatment unit, we were very well protected by our equipment and our protocols. But I also had to take care of patients in the emergency room and, and I had to triage sick patients who were coming to our hospital. And while I will never know for sure exactly how I contracted yeah, Ebola, I will never know the moment, but I, I think, I'm, I'm confident that it was with one of those patients outside of the treatment unit when I was not fully protected by the equipment and the protocols. Uh, and I think it was probably when I held a, the hands of the daughter of a patient, mm -hmm. trying to, to offer sympathy to her as her mother was dying from Ebola. And I think her hands were dirty, and I think that's how I got it. Yeah. What was the first thing you thought when you found out that you have Ebola? My very first thought was, okay, what is next? What's our plan? How are we going to, to treat this? And my second thought was, how am I going to tell my wife, who was thousands of miles away in America with our children? Uh, what, what was uh, crucial to the vir virus to reverse? Uh, what are the most important things that made the difference in your treatment? If we know that uh, in some cases 90% of people mm -hmm. infected die. The foundation of treatment for Ebola is supportive care. It's IV fluids, it is vitamins and antibiotics, uh, and, and that there is no, no direct treatment for Ebola, there is no cure. I did receive an experimental medication and the studies on that medication are, are still uh, in process. They're still processing the data to determine if that medicine is effective or not. But I in think- In your it, case, it was. I think it's a combination of factors. I think I received an experimental medication. I had some very compassionate, committed people who were taking care of me and offering supportive care. And there were thousands of people around the world praying for me 
and and I attribute my survival, my recovery to all of those things. There were uh, there was a widespread panic around the world uh, about uh, the treat of the disease. In one of your interviews, you're saying that in the United States there was a uh, lots of panic and mm -hmm. uh, but that it was unnecessary. Why do you think that it was unnecessary panic? I think panic paralyzes us. It keeps us from responding uh, proactively. And, and in a situation like this Ebola outbreak, the necessary response is to engage, to be active, not to be in panic and defensive. Panic makes you not think clearly. It makes you not see the bigger picture. And so as people gave in to their fear and panic, rather than staying clear-minded and thinking about the people involved, uh, I think it, it muddied the waters of our thoughts. Uh, what do you think, uh, what and who created this panic worldwide? Do you think maybe the ignorance contributed to the fear? I think, I think panic was a result of fear, and I think fear uh, comes in part from ignorance, and not ignorance as in foolishness, but ignorance as in lack of knowledge. And we are afraid of things we don't understand. And Ebola, although it has been around for nearly 40 years, was, was unknown to most of the world, and so we were afraid of it. Do you think that there's a lack of knowledge in the United States in general? I think, I think the general public in the United States knew very little about Ebola before this event. Do you think that uh, there, is, uh, there isn't a good enough protection system from dangerous viruses in the world today? And uh, if there is a solid protection, why do people always raise so great panic? Mm. In almost every case, the measures taken for some time produce results. And uh, there is no doubt that humanity has overcome more, m most horrible diseases. Why do we panic so much if we have a good system? Well, do we have we, actually good protection system? We panic because of fear. I think the world always needs improved systems for managing disasters like this. And you know, the World Health Organization responded in West Africa and they have they have said that their response was was lacking in the earliest days of the outbreak. And I think that was true for the international community. We did not see the reality of the threat of Ebola initially. And then when we did see the threat, we panicked. Um, Are we more prepared now? I think the World Health Organization has made good strides in improving their disaster response. And I, I think one lesson we've learned from this outbreak, from this experience, is that we all, as an international community, we have to work together. We can't say that's a faraway place, they can handle it on their own. We all have to partner together because we are all part of one big global community. Sure. How did it happen then from such an alarming situation, it rapidly became stabilized? Well, it wasn't so rapid. The outbreak began in December of 2013 and it was not declared officially over until January of 2016. So it was more than two years. How did they manage to do that? I think it was a combination of the natural course of the disease and the eventually robust response from the international community. And, and I think it was also due to the, the great courage and efforts of the people in West Africa who were most directly affected. Uh, what do you say to those who argue that such viruses are artificially controlled? <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure I have much to say to those people. I, having been there on the ground and seen the way it all played out, I, I we have a lot of we have a lot of people think like that in in this country. So that's no. why I'm asking you this question. That's a it's a it's a difficult question because I was the victim of of this outbreak. I was one of 25,000 victims in this outbreak. And um, I think we try to explain things with conspiracy theories and with, with 
uh, explanations blaming other people. But those don't get us very far. Having been in the middle of this disaster, I, I've seen how those theories are, and so, sometimes they're laughable. They are, they're, it's almost humorous. Um, there, there would be, it would take a very evil person to, to carry out that kind of atrocity. Um, and I think rather than trying to find a person or people to blame, we need to work together to find solutions to prevent it from happening again. What did you thought when uh, you find out that you're cured? What was your first thought? My first thought was, thank God. I, I thanked the people who took care of me in Liberia and at Emory University in Georgia. I, I thanked Samaritan's Purse, my employer, who, who went to great effort to bring me home when I was sick. I thanked the United States government who opened the doors to let me come back to America. Um, and I thanked God for all of those people who played such important roles in my recovery. Do you consider yourself a lucky person? I think I'm very fortunate and I, I, I thank God for, uh, for the resources that were made available to me uh, in, in my treatment. Do you plan to go back to West Africa? My family and I were able to go back last summer in 2015 to visit our friends and colleagues there. It was a very special, a very special trip to return to our home there in Liberia and to be reunited with our colleagues. How's the feeling? It was, it was sad uh, to see the damage that was done in that place by Ebola, but it was also, uh, it brought a lot of joy to see my friends who had lived through such a terrible time and see them now doing well. Uh, in your opinion, can we feel safe from uh, other viruses in the future? Can we feel safe in the developed world? I think we, we should not feel overconfident. I think we need to realize that we live in a very interconnected world. And just because we live in a developed country does not mean we are uh, totally protected from things that happen in places like West Africa. We have to recognize our interconnectedness and we have to uh, learn to view each other as neighbors. And, and I was motivated to go to Liberia by my religious faith and the teaching of Jesus to love your neighbor as yourself. I think we all would do well to recognize our global neighbors and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Dr. Bentley, thank you for your conversation. Thank you. I Igor. wish you all the best. Thank you.